So Brother Brooks is a very busy man and uh, appreciate his dedication to the ministry and <clears throat> the service of the Lord. And, and on top of all of that, he, he doesn't have enough support. At one time, he was trying to work a part-time job and pastor both of those churches, and that got overwhelming for him, and he to mess his health up, so he had to give that up. So I think some additional folks have since started trying to help him and support him. But man, I praise the Lord for men like that who just do whatever's got to be done to get the job done and just go do it. Amen. So the second that he's pastoring there, the pastor left, or I don't know exactly what the situation was now. He's been doing that for a number of years. And they never were able to find another pastor, so he just worked it out. I think it's about an hour and a half away from where his first church is at. And so he's just been pastoring both of them. So what a blessing. All right, we'll continue. Turn to Genesis chapter 26, if you will. We'll continue with our Bible terminology class, lesson number three this evening. We'll look at uh, maybe seven or eight words tonight as time allows, and then we'll try to begin looking at some, some uh, basic Bible doctrines as well, if we have time, whatever we have time for. If I were to take the time to look at every passage and every reference that I would like to in regard to these, we wouldn't get very far at all. And I'm not sure exactly <clears throat> what we'll do, but we'll, we'll get started and go as far as we can. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to reach a certain place or anything like that. We'll just, um, just try to follow the Lord and do what's pleasing to Him and get in as much as we can. So let's pray together. And we have, on, in the last lesson, we moved into some B words, words that start with the letter B. We'll continue that tonight with the first word being B times, B-E-T-I-M-E-S. And so let's pray together and we'll look at this word. Father, we love you. We thank you for the great privilege to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Thank you for folks who have made their way out on this Wednesday afternoon to be with us in church. I pray, Lord, that you would help us tonight. We've enjoyed our time together. We've enjoyed the opportunity to pray together. And we've enjoyed the opportunity to sing together. Would you help us now to enjoy our time of Bible study together? And uh, Lord, we sure thank you for all that you have done and are doing in our lives. And we do desire that you speak to our hearts tonight from your word. And for that, we will thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the word betimes, I mentioned B-E-T-I-M-E-S. This word betimes is found five times in five verses in our King James Bible. If you didn't know what the word meant, you might assume or you might think that the word means many times. In fact, I have heard that definition of many times, and, and it does seem like that could certainly be possible, but it doesn't match Scripture. The word actually means quickly, soon, early, or before it is too late. It's, one of the actual, it's actually what the word means. Now let me give you some Bible Scripture. We'll look at that. Turn to Genesis chapter 26, Genesis chapter 26, and look at verse number 31, Genesis chapter 6, verse 31. The Bible says they rose up B times. Now, you don't get up many times, you get up early or you get up quickly. They rose up B times in the morning and swear one to another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And now, so look at look at one more time. There, it's in the Bible five times. We'll only look at two of them. Come to Proverbs chapter thirteen. Proverbs chapter thirteen, if you will, and we'll look at it one more time. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter thirteen and verse number twenty-four. Proverbs thirteen, verse twenty-four. Familiar verse. The Bible says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. Now, I, I know there's, I, I needed chastening many times, <laughs> but that's not what the word means. It, it be time, it means quickly. You need to chasten him quickly or before it is too late. And uh, it is very obvious that sometimes folks wait too late to start chastening their children. Uh, now, in spite of what the children's advocate groups have to say, suggesting that we ought to just pamper our children and give them everything that they ask for, 
and never correct them. God says that to a loving parent will use the rod B times or he'll use it quickly or soon or early before it is too late. You can wait till it's too late to start correcting and chastening your children. They get to a certain age and they get to a certain size and, and uh, it's, it becomes too late to chasten them. You have to start that at an early age. So B times. Now let's look at another word. Actually, we're going to do a comparison between two words. Come back to Genesis, if you will. Genesis 32 and Job chapter 9. Genesis 32 and Job chapter 9. I want to look at two words, give you a comparison of two words. And I want to do that because the majority of dictionaries say they mean the same thing. And biblically, we can see that they do not mean the same thing. And that is these two words, betwixt, B-E-T-W-I-X-T, betwixt and between, B-E-T-W-E-E-N, betwixt and between. Now, the word betwixt is found 16 times in 15 verses in the Bible. And the word between is used quite often in the Bible. In fact, it's in 232 times in 205 verses in the Bible. Now, a lot of folks think that these two words mean exactly the same, but they're not the same word, and they do have a different meaning. The word betwixt, the word betwixt speaks of a space that separates two persons or two things. Now, in Genesis chapter 32, where I'm going to read, Jacob and Esau are going to be reunited after a large or a lengthy separation. In fact, the, until this time here in Genesis chapter 32, the last time that Jacob saw Esau, Esau had vowed to kill him for stealing or taking his birthright. And so Jacob had fled and went down to Laban's house and he's gotten wives and cattle and all that stuff. And he's coming back to his homeland and he is going to have a meeting with his brother Esau. And look what he says in Genesis chapter 32 and verse number 16. Now remember the word betwixt means to, it speaks of a space that separates two groups or two persons or two things. And he says in verse 32, Genesis chapter 32 verse 16, And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves. And they, and said unto his servants, Pass over before me and put a space betwixt drove and drove. Now, just, just briefly, that's not the word we're studying, but to tell you what a drove is, you and I, we would speak of herds of cattle or flocks of sheep. But e e either one of those or whatever they may be, if you are, you ever heard of a cattle drive? You are, you're driving the cattle or the sheep, a drove. So what, whatever this is, these are, these cattle, these sheep, he separate them, he said, every drove by themselves. So there's a herd of cattle, there's a, uh, a flock of sheep, or the case may be, but separate those droves, don't send them at the same time. And so it speaks of a space that separates two persons or two things. Now look in Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. Hold your place in Genesis. We're going to come right back to Genesis. Job chapter 9. <clears throat> so betwixt speaks of a space that separates two persons or two things. Betwixt also speaks of the separation between two persons or things. So it speaks of the space and it also speaks of the separation. Look at Job chapter 9, verse 33. Here's a verse you know very well. Job said, Neither is there any daysman betwixt us that might lay his hand upon us both. And so the word betwixt, Job, of course, was saying that there was, there was no Savior that lays hand upon him and God so they could be connected. Of course, we know that Jesus Christ spanned that gulf. Thank the Lord for that. So the emphasis of betwixt is not on two, on two being separate, it speaks of the, an actual separation between them. There is, a, there is a space or a distance between them. In other words, they are apart one from the other. They're not together. Now, between, let me show you the difference that, 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 and between. Come back to Genesis and look at Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. Now, the word between generally speaks of a common partnership. There is a mutual relation or accord. They're in agreement. I'll get a good example of that. Here's in Genesis 9 
and verse number 13. Now, in Genesis chapter 9, you know, the, the flood is over. God's promised not to destroy the water with the flood again. And uh, he gave a, co a covenant. He made a covenant with the earth and with man. And look what he says in verse number 13, Genesis chapter 9. He said, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me, that's God, and the earth. And so this is a common or a mutual agreement made between God and the earth. And so there is definitely a difference between the words betwixt and between, even though most dictionaries are going to tell you they mean the same. One speaks of a separation of space, and one talks about a common partnership or a mutual relation. So that's betwixt and between. Now, here's, a, here's another word. This is not, if you're keeping up with the words, this is number 30. I should have probably told you that. We looked at B times. That's number 28. Betwixt and between 29. 30, bereath. Now, the word bereath, B-E-W-R-A-Y-E-T-H, is found four times in four verses in our Bible. And the word bereath means to show, it means to make visible, it means to disclose or to reveal. Now, the word beray is not the same as betray. I really didn't mean to do this as a comparison again, but the word beray does not mean the same as betray. They're two entirely different words, and exactly how they're different is this. The word the word betray, when you betray, you disclose by telling. Or when, and when you betray, you disclose by showing. I want to say that again. When you betray, you disclose by telling or speaking. And when you betray, you disclose by showing, by doing something that is observable. Now, let me give you an example. Come to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14 and verse number 10. I was just talking about Judas Iscariot going to betray the Savior. Mark chapter 14, verse number 10. The Bible says, And Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went unto the chief priests to betray him unto them. Verse number 11. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he saw how he might conveniently betray him. So Judas betrayed by telling the Lord's enemies where they could find the Lord, where he might be found. And so he betrayed by telling. Now come to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew chapter 26, I'm going to begin reading in verse 69. And we're going to talk about the time when Peter denied the Lord. I'm, I'm sorry, verse 69. Matthew 26, I'm going to begin reading in verse 69. Verse 73 is the verse we're looking for, and the word is bereath. In, in verse 69, the Bible says, Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto him that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said unto Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech bereath thee. So Peter did not tell those surrounding the fire there where he was at that he was one of Jesus' disciples, but they observed by observation they, and by his speech, his speech bereath them. His actions and his speech did not match. And so uh, praise the Lord for a Bible that, that details all of, these, all of these minor little things that help us understand the Bible. Now, look, look, come, let, me, let me show you one more verse about this. Be ready. Come to Proverbs real fast. It'll be easy to find. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. Proverbs chapter 29. <clears throat> Proverbs 29, verse 24. We see this word be rayeth again. It says, Whoso is partner with a thief hateth his own soul. He heareth cursing, now notice this, and bewrayeth it not. 
So here, your silence in the presence of another sin is fault on you, and it will ultimately ensnare you or snare you. And so it has to do with not your speech, but your actions concerning the things. So be wrath. All right, number 31, blands. Come to Exodus 9. Blands is something I hope I never have to deal with. Exodus chapter 9. These have to do with some of the plagues that God placed upon the Egyptians when the children of Israel were in bondage. Exodus chapter 9. The word blands is only found two times in the Bible. We'll look at both of them. They're right here together. And Exodus 9, verse 9 and verse 10. Exodus 9, verse 9. And it shall come to, and it, and it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt and shall be a boil breaking forth with blands upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. Verse 10, And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and it became a boil breaking forth with blands upon man and upon beast. Now, if you had to guess from its context, just by reading those verses of Scripture, you could probably guess that this was some form of, of disease, and if that's the case, you would be correct. So a bland is, is one of two things. It's either one of two things, and from the context, we can tell which one it is, I'm pretty sure. So, uh, number one, it's an inflammatory swelling. It's a blister or a sore or a fester. Number two... It is a growth at the root of the tongue or against the windpipe which swells so as to stop the ability to breathe. Now, because the verses that we read, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that these blands were upon man, we would pick the first definition. Now, I think it's a strange thing that men will argue that the King James Bible, they argue with the King James Bible or about the King James Bible, because it doesn't use everyday terms for medical situations or medical problems. Yet if you have visited, and I haven't, but if you have visited a doctor or a pharmacist lately, they don't use any medical terms you understand today either. And so why would it be, why would it be different then, amen, than it is now? Just, just believe the Bible. Come to Matthew chapter 14, Matthew chapter 14. The, the 32nd word, word number 32, is bolstrous. Bolstrous. B O I S T E R O U S. Boisterous, actually, probably. Be a correct pronunciation. Boisterous. It's only found one time in the Bible. It's right here in Matthew chapter 14, and it had to do when Jesus was walking on the water. Matthew chapter 14, look what the Bible says in verse number 30. Now, this is talking about Peter walking on the water. In verse number 30, the Bible says, But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Aren't you glad that short prayers can often get great results? I, I tell you, Peter's glad of that, amen. You and I have been glad of that many times as well. Now, of course, this is the account of the great storm that had come upon the disciples. And during this storm, Jesus came walking to them on the water, and Peter wanted to do the same. And so the Lord bade Peter to come to him. He was doing fine walking on the water until he began to look down. You know, the wind was boisterous. Now, the word boisterous means, and it's a very long definition, it means acting with noisy turbulence, with violence and fury, it is rough. It is involving threatening violence. It's associated with violence, indicating or possessing might. It is strong and powerful. And so this was not, I think, all this um, extended definition, we can certainly tell from the, from the word that this was, no, this was not a, a, a light breeze, if you will. It was... Uh, it was very violent. The wind was raging. It was very violent. It was not something, any kind of casual little storm. I would imagine it would have been rough to be in the boat, much less be walking on the water. And so Peter saw this, and he began to sink, and he prayed the short prayer, of course, and the Lord saved him. I, what a great blessing it is that Jesus walked atop of such storm, 
uh, owned the water with no problem at all whatsoever. Be one thing you see all these people trying to uh, imitate Jesus, and they doing all kind of pranks trying to walk on water. But have you ever noticed that it's always in a pool or something, and the water's real smooth? Well, Jesus was walking on the waves. He was, he was walking on the boisterous water. I mean, it, was, it just proves that he has command and control of all of his creation. He, his, uh, the wind is in his dominion. The sea is in his dominion. All of it belongs to him. And what a blessing. He can walk on water. It doesn't matter if it's smooth or raging or whatever the case may be. He's God. Amen. Now, come back to Exodus chapter 9 again. We'll look at another word, boiled. Word number 33, word number 33. B-O-L-L-E-D, boiled. It's only found one time in the Bible. It's in Exodus 9. It's not talking about boiling water either. So, boiled, B-O-L-L-E-D. Exodus 9, verse 31. <clears throat> the Bible says, And the flax and the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was boiled. Boiled. Ever how you say that word? B o l o e d. Boiled. So a bowl is the seed-bearing capsule of certain plants. It's the top of the plant that holds the seed, and um, especially in cotton or flax. I know nothing about cotton or flax either one. I did quite a bit of helping my uncles and different people farm when I was a kid, but. Um, we was always farming tobacco, so we didn't have, have no idea, know nothing about cotton and flax. But uh, anybody that has uh, been associated with these, uh, with the growing or production of cotton, has heard of what's known as a bull weevil, weevil, B O O L weevil, W E E V I L, not bull weevil, and not the cartoon bullwinkle either. It's, it's a bull weevil. I don't know how I thought about that. I hadn't seen bullwinkle in years. I might have to look him up. I haven't been a long time. So uh, a weevil, a weevil is a kind of beetle, and a bull weevil, b o b o l l weevil, is a beetle that destroys the bull, which is the capsule of the plant that holds the seed. Now, this is closely. Uh, akin to bull is the Bible word bow, which is to enclose the bodily organs. But this, I think this really helps us to understand some of the severity of this plague upon Egypt, that God destroyed the flax, he destroyed the, the barley was smitten, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was boiled. What that meant was when God chose to smite those crops in Egypt because Pharaoh would not let his people go, he did so by destroying the standing grain that was holding the seed. And by doing that, it would indicate that their heads was full, meaning that harvest time was near. And this plague meant that it was going to be at least one whole year of hunger for the Egyptians. So it was not a, it was a severe situation. Now come to 1 Samuel chapter 19. 1 Samuel chapter 19, we'll look at word number 34, bolster. B-O-L-S-T-E-R, bolster. 1 Samuel chapter 19. <clears throat> now the word bolster is found six times in six verses in the Bible. We'll begin reading in verse number 11, 1 Samuel 19. Look at verse number 11. If I start reading that far back, it'll... You'll have the context you need. Saul's trying to kill David. I'll tell you that. The Bible says in verse number 11, Saul sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of, goat, of goat's hair for his bolster and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, bring him up to me in the bed that I may slay him. And when the messengers would come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his bolster. 
Now, boy, this Saul, he's a nice guy, isn't he? And he, he came to David's house, and he's going to kill David. He's going to take his life. His wife said he's sick. And uh, so the men went back and told Saul, and they said, well, bring him up here. I'll kill him in his bed. And uh, it's some kind of mighty warrior, isn't it? We'll just kill the guy while he's down. You know, there won't be no fight to it. But anyway, that doesn't have anything to do with a bolster. A bolster is a, is a long pillow that is used to support the head of persons lying on a bed. And it is usually laid under another of smaller pillows, or under a number of smaller pillars. And so this, he, she laid this, I don't know, may, I get the idea of like a body pillow or something. And she covered that thing up to make it look like David was laying in the bed and she put some goat's hair on it. David's hair must have been something awful, you know. If you can use goat's hair to represent your hair, um, that sounds like a stiff, matted mess to me. But um, I don't know. Maybe she fixed it up real nice. Maybe she was a beautician. But anyway, uh, these guys, these guys thought that David was laid in the bed, so they left. And but anyway, that's what a bolster is. I I don't know for sure. I, it seems like to me it would be like what you and I might think of today as a body pillow, and they covered that thing up to make it look like David was laying there. All right, booties, B-O-O-T-I-E-S. Come to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. The word booty is only booties. The word booty is in the Bible a few times, but the word is in the Bible three times. But booties, plural, is only in the Bible one time in our King James Bible. And I do want to tell you this while you're turning to Habakkuk chapter 2. It's not that little sock or shoe-like thing that we put on babies today and call them booties. That's, that's, that's not what it is at all. <clears throat> so the lone reference is found here in Habakkuk chapter 2. Look what the Bible says in verse number 7. The Bible says, Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee, and awake that shall vex thee, and thou shalt be for booties unto them? Now, booties are the individual, if I'm saying that word correctly, I think I am, are the individual items that is seized by violence or by robbery. And it especially has to do with spoils that is taken in war. You know, they would go in and they would take, uh, they would uh, have these, these wars and they would they'd kill all the people and they would take all their goods, all their belongings. And so it has to do with the uh, the spoils of war when, when soldiers would be plundering and, and pillaging. Now, the word booty, B-O-O-T-Y, is actually the sum total of booties. And that word's found three times in the Bible, in the book of Numbers uh, 31, Jeremiah 49, Zephaniah chapter 1. We won't, we won't look at, at those. So the word booties is, is similar to the word spoils. It was the ruin of people and villages to have all their hardened possessions taken away, thus spoiled. Now, we use the word spoiled in our day to say that we have spoiled our children or we have spoiled our grandchildren. And what that actually means is that we have filled them with possessions that were not earned or that they did not work for. And so these this booties, these spoils that they had taken was something that they had taken in by robbery or by pillaging in war. Okay, that will we'll stop there with the definitions. We will look at a uh, misunderstood Bible doctrines. And so this will be Bible doctrine number two. And I want to talk about a term, a word that is not found anywhere in the Bible, but it is amillennialism or amillennial. Now, by definition, the word amillennialism or the word amillennial, you want me to spell it for you? A-M-I-L-L-E-N-N-I-A-L-I-S-M. It breaks down into three words. Mill means a thousand. An example of that would be a, a millipede has a thousand feet. They say it does. I've never counted them. And I don't know if you have or not. If you, if you ever do, let me know. Now, so mill, and then the, the word, I guess, uh, ennial, E-N-N-I-A-L, means year. Now, you and I, we, we are familiar with the word annual, which means yearly. But the word, uh, the little, I don't know if it's really a word, but the phrase in the, in the middle of that millennium, E-N-N-I-A-L, means year. So millennium means 1,000 years. And... Um, 
we that are Bible believers, we are millennialists. We believe in a future thousand-year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ upon this earth. Now, we talked about this in the last lesson that we had. A in front of any word means no. And so an amillennialist or an millennium is someone who is saying there is no millennium or that there is no thousand-year reign of Christ and his saints upon the earth. Now, <coughs> we're not going to run all the scriptures. I will say, I have a whole, whole list of them. If we, if we ran all the scriptures, we would certainly have no problem believing that the Bible teaches that there's going to be a time yet future where the Lord Jesus Christ will return and he will return to this earth. He will sit upon the throne of David as king. And Matthew chapter 25, he'll, he'll ta this will take place in the city of Jerusalem. He will rule with a rod of iron, according to Isaiah chapter 9, chapter 2, chapter 11, Luke chapter 1. And also ruling during this thousand year reign will be the 12 apostles, according to Matthew chapter 19. Uh, the tribulation saints who are beheaded because of Christ, they're found on the, you know, on the altar Roman, in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 4. Uh, the church age believers who have faithfully suffered and served, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and Luke chapter 19 and also Revelation chapter 5. So the Savior is definitely going to come back to this earth. He's going to sit on the throne of David. He's going to rule here, reign here for a thousand years. The apostles, the, uh, the tribulation saints who are beheaded, the church age believers, all of us are going to rule and reign with him for a thousand years upon this earth. All the earth will annually come to worship Jesus in Jerusalem, according to Zechariah chapter 14. And so with all of this information that we have in the Bible about a future millennium, where Christ will reign on this earth, I don't know how anyone could be an amillennialist or, 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 or whatever you want to call them. They are just denying Bible truth, amen, if you deny the millennium. Now here, here's something that will probably take up the remainder of time because I do want to look at several things in the Bible here. And it's just because in the time that we live, there's so much misunderstanding about angels. I don't think you guys have a misunderstanding about angels. But Bible doctrine number three will have to do with angels. Now, the word angel in several different forms is found 297 times in the King James Bible. And it's in 283 verses. Now, angels are part of a heavenly host which includes angels, archangels, cherubims, seraphims, uh, sons of God, morning stars. In other words, all of, these, all of this heavenly host were created before this world was created, according to this passage. Come to Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. <clears throat> God asked Job some good questions here. It's good for us. Puts us in our place. The Lord asked Job in, in verse number 4, Job 38, Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. <laughs> I like, don't you like that? Where was you at when I laid the foundations of this earth? Tell me if you know. That's about what he's saying there. I said in verse number 5, Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched a line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? Now look what he says here. When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So these morning stars that are made mention of here are angels, these sons of God. It says all the sons of God. This was before the fall that the Lord is talking about when he's speaking to Job here in Job 38. They were singing and they were shouting for joy when God created the earth. Now, angels are spirits, therefore they are not confound or confined, I should say, to, to uh, bodies, if you will. Now, they do inhabit bodies often, we'll see that, but they're not confined to a flesh and blood body. Several things that angels can do that you are aware of, but I, I want to read them just because they're cool. Come to Acts, we're going to come to Judges in just a moment, but come right now to Acts chapter 12, if you will. Acts chapter 12. Angels can enter locked prisons without being noticed. 
That's, that's fun. Wouldn't that be fun? Look at Acts chapter 12. Look at verse number 7. Now, Peter's in, in jail here, obviously. And the Bible says in verse number, Acts chapter 12, verse number 7, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side, and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and was not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but though he, but though he saw, a, but thought he saw a vision. Verse number 10, When they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him." And so the angel of the Lord, he came to the prison. He was, had access to the prison any way that he wanted it, amen. And he, he loosened Peter's chains. He, I like that he woke Peter up. Peter wasn't too worried, amen. And he's in the prison. He's asleep. The angel woke him up. He, he loosened his chains. He opened the gate. He let him out. And so he can enter locked prisons. He can open prison doors. We see that here. We also see that in Acts chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. They're often mistaken as men. We'll read about that here in just a moment. That sometimes they're even referred to as men of God. Look at Judges. I want to read this in Judges chapter 13. When the angel told Manoah and his wife that she was going to conceive and bear a son. And of course that son was Samson. Look at this in Judges chapter, Joshua, Judges chapter 13. We wouldn't have to read all of this to see what I talk about, but I don't, this is just a great chapter, so why, I think we'll just read it all. So in this chapter, we're going to see that this angel is confused as a man, as a man of God. And he will also see something really, really neat at the end of this angel ascended up in a flame of fire off of the altar. Well, the Bible, I'll just read, beginning in verse number 1, Judges chapter 13, verse number 1. The Bible said, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zoriah of the family of the Dantites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines." Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, now look what, look what she says, a man of God. Well, the Bible plainly says in verse number three, it's an angel of the Lord. But she came to her husband and said, a man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Ask him not whence he was, neither told he me his name. And he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine, nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord and said, O my Lord, let the man of God, which thou didst send, come again unto us, and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God, see, he, he said man of God, verse number 8, verse number 9 says, And the angel of God came again unto the woman, as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. And that, somebody told that, that God spoke to the woman before he did the man, and God told the woman what he was going to do before he told the man, and then the woman had to go and tell the man, and then he prayed and asked God, and God showed up and told the woman again before he told the man. God's no respecter of persons. He can speak to who he wants to, when he wants to, how he wants to. He's God. You can't put him in your little box. So the woman made haste, and she ran, and showed her husband, and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me at, that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose, and went after his wife, and came to the man, and said unto him, Art thou the man that speaketh unto the woman? He said, I am. 
And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child, and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine, nor strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread, and if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Manoah still thinks he's a man. Verse number 17, And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name, that when, thou say, that when thy sayings come to pass, we may do thee honor? And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? So Manoah took a kid of the meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of, flame of the altar. Wouldn't you like to see that? The Bible says that he did wondrously. I'd like to see what he did. Maybe the Lord will show us that one day. And then he, he ascended in the flame of the altar. The Bible says that Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife than Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. So Manoah didn't, even, didn't realize it was an angel of the Lord all the way to verse 21. He continually thought it was a man. Verse number two, uh, verse number 22, And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. Now think about this. God has told you, your wife, you're going to have a, you're going to have a son. He's going to be a deliverer of Israel. Israel's been in bondage for 40 years. He's going to be a Nazarite. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do the other. I'm going to use this man to deliver Israel. And yet when Manoah realizes that he's an angel of the God, he said, we've seen God, we're going to die. His wife had way more understanding. Look at verse 30, 23. But his wife said unto him, if the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering in our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would as at this time have told us such things as these. And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson, and the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. So a lot of things here about an angel in this chapter. He was mistaken for man, even mistaken for a man of God. He, did, he acted wondrously, whatever that is, and he ascended in the flame of fire off of the altar. So they can ascend in a flame. Now, there is, there is so, much, so much more about this angel, but we're out of time, and I ain't even got started. That They can travel great distances very, very quickly. Uh, we see that in Daniel chapter 10. The, the job of the angels is to wait on or to serve God by carrying out specific tasks. They're called ministering spirits. That's why they're called ministering spirits in Hebrews chapter 1. As supernatural beings, they're superior to man. The Bible says in, in Psalm 8, verses 4 and 5, they're superior to man in wisdom and in strength. Um, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night in 2 Kings chapter 19. One angel slew 70,000 Israelites as a result of David's sin in 2 Samuel 24. One angel will overthrow the great city of Babylon, according to Revelation chapter 18. One angel broke the seal and rolled away the stone from the tomb in Matthew 28. One day an angel will bind the devil and imprison him for a thousand years, according to Revelation 20, verses 1 through 4. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again because I like it. I remember, uh, I don't know how many years ago it was, 20-some years ago now probably, Dr. Ronald Leslie, who's in heaven now, was preaching from Revelation chapter 20, and he, he got to talking about this angel binding Satan for a thousand years. And he, he said, uh, he said I, in my mind, I get this idea. We have all these 
I, and, you know, I know Satan's powerful and all that, and he causes all this trouble and all these problems. He said, but I like to think about it like this. I, th I like to think about the Lord looking around heaven and finding the scroniest, weakest angel he has. And this is probably why I remember it. He said, well, call him Tiny Tim. And he, <laughs> and he says to Tiny Tim, the runnest angel of the bunch, I got a job for you to do. And he hands him a chain, and he says, I want you to go bind Satan the dragon, the serpent, the devil, and I want you to cast him into a bottomless pit for a thousand years. And he told that for this. He said, God has one angel that can do all of these. One, I mean, why in the world would you ever equate his power to be anywhere even associated with the power of God when he can get one angel of a host of thousands and have that one angel bind Satan with a chain and cast him into a bottomless pit? That's how much power our God has, amen. And so, what a blessing. So, it does show you that angels have quite a bit of power. Now, there's, there's so many things here I would like to read, but time will not allow. So, I'll, I'll just mention so we can get through. I'm not even going to get through angels if I just read the rest of this. So, why don't we just stop and we'll go through it and link next time. How about that? All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the Bible and the opportunity to study the Bible together. Uh, we thank you for your blessings and your goodness upon us this evening. I pray you would help us, Lord, as we continue to study the Bible, to be pleasing to you in all that we do. And, Father, for that, we'll not fail to thank you or praise you, Lord, for your blessings and your goodness toward us. Please bless your word, we pray, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you. So